Thank you, Jan. Thank you, Vola, Tom, for being here. I think this is a group that is very much freedom loving and especially excited about fighting for freedom. And I think we will all be very happy to hear from you who have been particularly involved in this fight for several years in different countries uh, of residence or not residence. Um, and I th I'm pretty sure we're going to have a very interesting discussion today. Uh, firstly, I would like to set a scene. Um, what do you think are the biggest challenges posed by liberal states? Which states are uh, the most challenging right now? And uh, on which levels they cooperate? Because we hear different things. Uh, every day we have discussions on cooperation, economic cooperation, ideological ties, uh, some initiatives that are being started by liberal states. And even more so, we hear about illiberal initiatives and ties to these illiberal states in the Western states that are liberal. So uh, let's get started with Tom, maybe, and uh, then we can move on to Vola. Well, I'd, I'd like to start out by acknowledging how wonderful HRF is, and Human Rights Foundation is really in the struggle in lots of ways, many of which are acknowledged, and some of which they have to be quiet about for uh, reasons of not endangering people. But you work for a first-class organization, and I really admire uh, HRF. Uh, I think that we should all be a little bit uh, open-eyed. This is not merely a battle of ideas. It is that. Ideas do clash. Ideas of individual freedom and dignity versus collectivism, submission, tyranny, uh, and so on. But the other thing that's happening is an illiberal international that is not like the old communist international, where they had some ideology that tied them together. They at least uh, nominally believed in Marxism-Leninism and the world will be better and colors will be brighter and food will taste better in the communist future, et cetera, et cetera. That, of course, dropped off at the end, but there was still this sense that there was an ideological contest. This is gone. What it is is liberalism versus all the others. And the others are now unified. So what is the ideological connection between the Islamic Republic of Iran, the Democratic People's Republic of Korea, the Communist Party of Cuba, the Bolivarian Socialism of the 21st century of Venezuela, Hezbollah, Hamas, now junior partner, the Hungarian government and Fidesz under Orban, and the Russian state with its toxic mixture of Soviet nostalgia, um, Russian orthodoxy, uh, and state religion and nationalism and chauvinism. What do they have in common? Really, it's hard to imagine that there's some ideological line, except they all hate pluralistic, free, self-governing societies. But they have another thing that ties them together, and that is they are all criminal syndicates. All of the leaders of these states are centimillionaires or billionaires. And they are fighting to protect power and money and all the things you can do with money. Drugs, prostitution, palaces, mega yachts, whatever happens to be their thing, and by the, the way, the Iranian state is just as corrupt uh, as the others. The leaders of the Revolutionary Guard and the Supreme Leader are centimillionaires and billionaires with estates and servants and yachts and all the rest. Uh, and this is now arrayed in an alliance to destroy us. There are a number of front lines. Venezuela is absolutely one right now, and it's on a knife edge. Ukraine, Georgia, these are really frontline states. And there are others that play lesser roles. A lot of things in the world have been coordinated. The October 7 attack in Israel, that massacred people and then began this horrifying war. This was understood and known by the Iranian state and the Russian state who supported it for their personal interests. They are willing to see thousands of people die to get Ukraine off the front page of the news, to create a diversion for them to continue their uh, activities. So we should be very open-eyed that we are dealing not just with college debaters, we are fighting against the mafia. And the mafia organized on a global scale like it has never been organized before. So on that cheery note, 
I'll turn it back. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Tom. Um, I think that there is not that much to add to this. The only thing I would like to stress here is that the additional thing that the autocracies don't care about is the human lives. They absolutely don't care about the well-being of people, about their thoughts, their freedoms, liberties, nothing. The only thing that matters is, is power, money, that's it, the, the cooperation for saving those. Um, not even some ideas are behind that. It's only the power, money, and well-being of themselves, I mean, like the autocrats and their families. That's pretty it. Um, and four years ago, almost three, four years ago, Belarus was on the front line as Venezuela is today. Uh, we were in the streets of Minsk and other cities, hoping that we will manage to break down Lukashenko. Unfortunately, it didn't happen. There is another, a number of things and reasons for it not to happen, and one of them is the cooperation of Lukashenko with Putin. And today we see in Ukraine, in the example of Ukraine, what it leads to. Um, more than just like holding the power in one country, but then they interfere in the other country. So it's a great example of how like one tiny country in the middle of Europe, a strategic country though, uh, cooperates with a huge autocrat, and it leads to the beginning of the war with, of autocrats or like the um, the mafia with democracy, freedoms, liberties. And it's our responsibility. It's not someone that has to come and solve those issues. It's our responsibility as citizens, as human beings, to stand in those front lines. It's not only the countries that directly participate in that fight right now, as Venezuela, Bolivia, uh, Cuba, Belarus, Ukraine, Georgia. It's everybody. And standing for democracy requires not only attention, but also actions of those who have the possibility to act um, as like on behalf of democratic states. Thank you. Um, let's talk more about this cooperation. We know the cooperation between Belarus and Russia, cooperation between Iran. We hear more and more about Russia and China being like a new pole that is forming up and more influence of China and the world in general, influence in African continent as well and around the world. And how, how did these cooperations came about and how are they sustained in the world where there's also cooperation between the liberal states, but still illiberal states and their cooperation multiplies every day? Well, I'll take a, a first uh, stab at this. It's the exploitation of the openness of our society, something we should be very proud of, but recognize it also means we are vulnerable in various ways. The Kremlin and its creatures have established so many front companies that own companies that own another company and so on. And, and I would just like to put out a call for anyone who's interested in open source intelligence and has a little bit of experience or willing to learn it, I can connect you with people who are using this to identify, for example, airplanes that fly to uh, uh, Algeria, to Iran, to this place, the other place, and they're owned by a company, owned by another company, and finally our friends keep digging and digging, and it's some Russian uh, figure uh, close to the Putin regime who's the ultimate owner, uh, but they use so many cutout companies, and now being able to, what our Ukrainian friends are doing is tracking the movement of these airplanes, and then trying to correlate them with Wagner mercenaries showing up in places, weapon shipments, are going to Africa, seven military coups in Africa, and every single one has the Kremlin's fingerprints all over it. They come to, I'll tell you what they're doing in Africa is horrifying. They go to states, they don't so much talk to the president or the, the Congress or the parliament, they go straight to the generals they say, what are you getting right now? And the general says, well, I'm, I'm as corrupt as I can be. I've got this much money. They say, that's nothing. Work with us. We'll get rid of those annoying politicians. And you can have, so what are you getting now? Two million a year? We'll make it 10, 10 million. But you give us the concession for the gold, uranium, and other resources. And by the way, any villagers you want us to wipe out? No, 
It's not a problem. We know how to do that really well. Uh, and they will do it, and then they will videotape it and show it to the local people to terrorize them, as they did in Syria, uh, dismembering people alive and putting it on their cell phones and then distributing it. This, this changes people's attitudes very quickly. Uh, so they've used this extractive system. They work closely with the Chinese government also for evading sanctions. They have suborned other states around the world, Turkey, which we could also add is kind of on the brink in a way, but in the autocratic camp, it's just an autocracy of convenience for Erdogan, but uh, money laundering and doing a lot of the dirty business uh, through Turkish institutions that are controlled by the state, Kyrgyzstan now, amazingly huge increase in computer imports and computer chips to, to Kyrgyzstan. Every sheep has a computer chip now uh, in Kyrgyzstan. These are all going into Russia. Um, they developed this network of tyrants who like being rich, and they help each other. And by the way, the Cuban crime family, the Castro family, they're not as effective, they're not billionaires, they're centimillionaires, and they have sucked that country dry. Then they colonized Venezuela, became a colony of Cuba. They sucked resources out of that country for the benefit of the criminal elite uh, in the Communist Party in Cuba. Uh, and these people have worked out a, just a global alliance. They don't always align. The Iranians, for instance, are clearly favoring Harris and opposed to Trump, but the Russians and everyone else are in favor of Trump. So there's a little, some occasional disagreements on these things, but by and large, they're, they're coordinating money flows, weapons flows, drug trafficking, massive drug trafficking that finances the Iranian state and Hezbollah, who are all throughout Latin America, and it has just grown. It's just grown over time, this network of f financing. And it's, it's, it's everywhere now. And it's in the United States. It's in Germany. They, they were deeply entwined with the German elites. Who knew you could buy a former chancellor so cheaply as Gerhard Schröder, who basically was purchased by the Russian state for a couple hundred thousand euros. I would have bought him if I knew he was so cheap. Um, so this has just grown over time, and now here we face it, and it's a pretty scary uh, thing to deal with. And the other thing is that they don't only cooperate doing themselves, uh, they don't buy the cooperation of each other through the resources, through the agreements, or like through supporting each other in the international bodies as the UN, like for example, okay, we are collaborating, and then I'm buying like the, the I have more kind of places there, whatever, whatever, or like you have the uh, my shoulder there. Uh, but they also buy kind of customers uh, in democratic states, or like semi democratic, somewhere in the middle. Um, and some people in Europe, in the US, in other countries may not support the Chinese government directly, or like CCP, Xi Jinping directly, uh, may not support Russia or Putin may not support Hungary or Urban, but they would buy the products from there. They will not check if the forced labor was used to produce those products. Uh, but it still develops the power of autocrats and those who don't care about human rights, don't care about human lives. They just destroy the nations, the whole nations, and they use that services to continue destroying them and us like silently allowing that to happen, uh, or not silently sometimes. But the issue is that we start reacting when it becomes too late. We realize that it happens, that it happened when it becomes too late, but they are preparing that for many years. They develop the strategies to occupy the power in the world, and we can just react to particular actions of theirs. And that's why we have to think, to try at least to think uh, more global to kind of try to identify what could be their next steps. How would they buy the opinion of the youth worldwide? How would they bring that opinion to their side? Or not maybe directly to their side, but from liberal ideas to the autocratic ones. We have to consider those options and we have to not just to answer to that, but to predict that. Thank you.
I think you mentioned an interesting point there about supporting these regimes indirectly, right? Um, what do you think can be done from the sides of maybe institutions or individuals um, to counter this? Because we, we had a discussion today about should we ban TikTok? Should we ban TikTok? Should we cut ties with China? Should we not support the labor of Uyghurs that way by banning it? Or IKEA, for example, which uses Belarusian labor in that way. Um, what are the solutions that you would think would be fit for that? And I think we can get to that as well. I think you had more to say. Um, I would say it's for me. It's really hard to think kind of out of box uh, because for more than twenty years I was growing up in Belarus. I was born in nineteen ninety nine. Lukashenko came to power in nineteen ninety four, so I was taught from the very childhood how to think only in that box, how to consider only the ideas that were brought from Russia, etc., etc. So I would say I'm just like at the very beginning of the path where I started exploring how could we oppose those uh, practices of authoritarian regimes. But what I think could be useful at least is to pay attention to that first, like bring uh, the information to people. Because it's the biggest issue that I see now is the indifference of people uh, and their readiness to accept any information without double checks, without the check of information that they get from any media. And these media are not, not that rarely bought by Russia or by China. And the information is brought like very, um, brought in a particular way, let's say. So they may not say in truth, untruths directly, but they will uh, put the seed of insurance and people insurance, uh, and people will develop it with time. Uh, and what they do is they see the thoughts of insufficiency of democracy, uh, that autocracy, dictatorship, the limitation of rights, the control of the government works better. Um, and here is a, a tiny example. Um, that I was sharing yesterday is that when Russians come to Belarus right now, having no idea what's going on in Belarus, they say, we feel freedom here because we can open Instagram without VPN. That's their freedom. That's the freedom uh, from, for the people from authoritarian countries. And that's what the authoritarian countries do. They make you feel that it's the freedom already. That's enough. You don't need any rights, any freedoms uh, anymore. You don't need any freedom to, like free access to anywhere. You just need to be free in opening social media without VPN. That's enough. So the idea is to just bring information, especially to the youth, about what is real freedom. And I think that the best thing that works, at least for me, is I learned from uh, my friends from different countries or activists, Tibetan activists, Uyghur activists, Hong Kongers, what happened to them because we don't really know what happens to people around the world until we talk to them. And that's also what works, limiting people from information. So what we need is to make the stories of the results of autocracy more public, because until people know, they say, oh, but you will live well in Belarus. It's very clean in the streets, you know? Um, you have a great ruler who knows what's best for people, and here is another point. When we do something for people, we have to ask what is best for them. We have to have kind of, kind of consultations with the youth, including like to include youth into the decision making, because it's the youth who are already the future, who are going to make those decisions for the world, for the particular countries. So if we don't include the youth to the decision making processes, they will have no idea how to act. They will have no idea of what is going on. And that's what we used to do we put the responsibility on the adults. And that's where we are now. You know, that's the world we have now, where 72% of the world are author under authoritarian regimes. So I would say these are the two easiest steps. That seem, I mean, that probably they're not that easy if they still don't work, but that's what I have in mind right now. Right. Right. So I, I'd like to add something that I overlooked. Uh, and it's a very important point that Roy has brought up here. What can we do? So um, I'm trying to get out of the mode of what ought to be done. What should they do, those other people? Is what should I do? What, what can I do? And there, 
we play a particularly strong role in confronting the ideology that they deploy. And they deploy it variously in different places. They're quite opportunistic. But in Europe uh, and North America right now, this post-liberalism ideology and the Hungarian state, which is it's another mafia state, uh, within the European Union, as, as Orban said, we are building an illiberal state within the context of the European Union, which I'll translate into English. It means at the expense of Danish taxpayers because they receive massive EU subsidies. That's what that means, at the expense of the EU. <clears throat> uh, but they have now put over a billion euros, 1.4 billion euros, which is a lot. That's more than I make in a year. Um, into this obscure little college, MCC, Matthias Corvinus Collegium, and turned it into a very well-endowed think tank propaganda machine for a kind of um, not less militant fascism. I want to be careful in my language. When we think fascism, we think of jackboots and the concentration camps. There are other varieties that were bad but not as horrifying, think Spanish phalangism and so on, it's, it's horrors also. And they are pouring money into scholarships and internships and it's wonderful, come to Budapest, have a fabulous time, be an intern here and read all of these post-liberal uh, writers. So Yoram Hazoni and Patrick Deneen and others, uh, the so-called integralists who want to integrate the church and the state again us, which is like a fight we fought a long time ago for freedom of religion, and they want to undo that. Um, this is a very serious movement, and even just 10 years ago, or five years ago, you said, oh, these, these, a couple of obscure academics. They may soon take over the American government. J.D. Vance is one of them. Uh, he embraces the whole anti-liberal agenda wholeheartedly. He identifies with this anti-market, anti-free trade, anti-toleration, anti-pluralism, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. <clears throat> and we can combat that. We can identify these ideas and openly talk about the benefits of the project of open, pluralistic, free societies in which we resolve differences by discussion. We don't demand everyone live the same way or embrace the same religion. We want open societies with a place for everyone willing to respect each other. That's it. They don't want that. And the MCC is pushing this poison through European universities all over and with lots of money, lots of money. And I've talked to friends that I know peripherally, I could say friendly, people I'm friendly with. They say, oh, I got this offer to go to Budapest. It's fabulous. They're paying for everything. And I said, well, you know, if you want to go, go. You're being financed by, by the state. Okay, so you can do that. But don't be seduced by this. But this is very much the agenda. Uh, it's, it's incredibly shallow philosophy. Patrick Deneen's books are almost laughable. In fact, I actually laughed when I opened up to page 26. And I read in his first book, the ancient Greeks believed this. I said, really, seriously, all of them? Uh, it turns out it was just Plato, but apparently Plato has been named the ancient Greeks. This is a kind of cartoon political philosophy, not serious, but it is taking power in a number of states. It is actually taking power. And this is something all of us can respectfully debate these ideas, say, I disagree with that. I don't see the world that way. Let me listen to what you're saying. And then I want to respond and defend the achievements of the enlightenment, of religious toleration, of pluralism. I want to defend the society in which people can marry whom they want and not have to bow down to someone else for their permission to live. And have the courage to stand up to them and take them on. And I think that intellectually we can win because most of these people have all the intellectual consistency of a cream puff. Uh, once you read their books, you realize there's just not much there. And I think our liberal uh, ideas are much stronger and more powerful.
That's something we can do, is when we he hear these neo-fascist, neo-collectivist ideas pop up, engage with them and argue against them and defend the free society with all of its flaws and imperfections, but defend it courageously because it, it needs us right now. Thank you for this addition. Unfortunately, Orban also closed down the Central European University several years before he opened this one. So basically got rid of liberal ideas and then he introduced the liberalism in the universities. Um, I think we talked a lot about cooperation between liberal states, which is highly incentivized because they are thieves <laughs> that are stealing from their countries and then cooperating to get more and more money. And um, how do we incentivize cooperation between liberal states, especially in the institutional framework where there's a lot of talk right now that there's lack of leadership. Who is Europe? What is European Union? There is Hungary in European Union. They cannot agree on one foreign policy. Then we have UN Security Council, which also cannot agree on um, basically anything. Um, so how do you think liberal states can cooperate in this defense of liberalism? Well, well I should say that first, uh, and for example, I think of UN, uh, because even for many years, UN was the only body available to the Belarusians to stand for their rights. I mean, not we were not a part of European Council, uh, so we couldn't appeal to the European Court of Human Rights, so we could only submit our uh, messages to the UN Human Rights Council. And uh, they gave the recommendations to the Belarusian state uh, about the violation of human rights, the supposed violations, what the Belarusian state could do in, in relation to that. And um, right now it's also not available because Belarus withdrawn from the optional protocol, so now we don't have an option to uh, state that our rights were violated by the Republic of Belarus. So in fact, the violations go absolutely, um, there is absolutely no responsibility for the state of the Republic of Belarus. And Belarus is not the only state on, like that. And the issue is that none of the bodies, international bodies, has any influence on that, has any particular way to influence the state of the Republic of Belarus is our example, or any other state. But at the same time, uh, we have, Iran and uh, China like making decisions in the UN. And of course they want to be done for the sake of Belarusian people or any other people whose rights are being violated. So what we see right now is we as activists are trying to find a way how to bring Belarus to accountability for the violation of human rights in Belarus, for the continuous torture, for the killing of people, etc., etc. And we are just like one of those countries who are trying to fight for that. Uh, so the issue is that there is not only no agreement, but there are also no developed strategies of how to influence the countries that violate international agreements that were concluded like yet before. Uh, so the countries just withdraw from the agreements, they just violate the agreements, and they have no responsibility. The impunity develops the impunity, and that's what they work with, that's what they play with, they just check uh, if there are any limits that the other states are going to accept, and there are no limits because they just go with impunity. So I would say that the first step for the, the uh, democratic liberal countries to agree on would be the, uh, the possibilities to influence the other countries. Uh, we, all of us saw how the countries were trying to agree on limiting the access of Russian resources to, the, to Europe. It took like two years to develop those strategies and not even to introduce them fully. There is still like Russian resources are being used. Russian businesses are being welcomed by some countries. Russia still has assets and uh, influence on the states here in Europe and not only in Europe. So it's not only about the agreement with the uh, authoritarian countries, it's about their influence on uh, liberal states. So it's about limiting the influence of those authoritarian countries to agree on for the liberal states, to agree on their influence on the, those, during those violations. Um, and to, I think it's time for the liberal states to face the reality we, where we need to be reactive, like not to react for two years, 
but to react as soon as possible to predict the situation that appear to be able to um to be strict in the in the decisions not to be like not try to be that liable to be that like trying to be on both sides to balance balance between something there is evil and there is good like in some situations the world is not like that fully but there have to be principles that have to be followed by the liberal states to defend democracy to defend liberties defend human rights uh, and right now we see that the previously used tactics don't work and the states are not ready to recognize that, not ready to say that, yes, we made mistakes and now we are ready to correct them. Uh, so they still try to use those uh, types of influence in, for example, Hungary, where they say like, okay, we will cut you from the resources. Okay, we will exclude you from the European Union. So what will it follow next? Do you think that Hungary will change something? Obviously not. So like, it's a game that doesn't lead anywhere right now. Uh, so I think, yes, it's time for the liberal states to reconsider the options to influence the states that are either already authoritarian or on the edge of authoritarianism. And yes, education, 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 for, not only for the youth, but also for the politicians, uh, bringing information about like how their influence, how their actions influence what, because they become indifferent. They, they think only about like the particular action, not about how it influences the future. So... Yeah, education, education. I had a, a couple notes on that. The, the assault on the free society is multi-front. I mean, it's happening in so many different ways, information space, obviously, military assaults in a number of countries, but also global international institutions like the United Nations are now being subtly put to work uh, by these states, for example, they're getting China and Syria on the Human Rights Commission. I mean, this is just, uh, I don't know what to say about it. It's, it's too absurd for words. But then they change the language that people have been able to appeal to. Think about the De Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which is, in my opinion, a very flawed document. I mean, the first 22 elements of it are absolutely spot on. I embrace them. After that, it gets kind of crazy. Everyone gets free dental care and holidays with pay, human rights put on the same level with the right to worship and so on. Uh, but those first 22 are very important. This is now being displaced by language pushed by China and Russia and Iran in particular of sovereignty and independence. If you criticize the genocide against the Uyghur people, you're impinging on Chinese sovereignty. You are disrespecting Chinese independence. You are, they even say this, you are violating the rights of Chinese people by criticizing them, the, their government, for what they're doing to Uyghurs and Tibetans and so on. And this is now worming its way into international legal documents and agreements. Anytime you see in these new documents, sovereignty, know what it means. It means we will do what we want with impunity to the people we own and control as our slaves, and you will not speak about it. And now, coming along with it, is language about extending their enforcement powers abroad. There are Chinese police who are patrolling the cities of Hungary, where they were also identified in the US, the UK, and Canada, unfortunately shut down. They police the, the local Chinese community, if they're from China, but even if they're local born people, Canadian citizens, they are policed, intimidated, harassed, and threatened by the Chinese police uh, who do this. And in Hungary, when Xi Jinping came, this is so shocking, in a European Union country, they festooned Budapest with Chinese communist flags. <clears throat> he was there. And a member of the Hungarian parliament tried to put up an EU flag and was assaulted by Hungarian-speaking Chinese police officers who would not allow him to put it up and physically assaulted him. He wasn't beaten or anything like that, but they physically assaulted him and stopped him from putting up an EU flag in his country, which is a member of the EU, because it would be disrespectful to Xi Jinping. 
So they are pushing this language out of international agreements and documents, and I think that's one thing that we need to, to uh, push back on very, very strongly. And let me mention one last thing we can do. Read, study. <clears throat> uh, this book, Anne Applebaum's book, which is coming out in German and Spanish shortly, Autocracy Incorporated, is a very good study of these global links among these otherwise disparate regimes you might think wouldn't have anything in common, the officially atheist regime of, of North Korea and the Islamist regime of Iran, who would know they would be close allies, but they have in common expensive alcohol and hookers as uh, things that the rulers like to get access to. A book that's a little bit out of date, but it's quite good, Balin Mujar's a post-communist mafia state, the case of Hungary, how Fidesz dug its fingers into uh, establishing their power in Hungary. Uh, Nevzlin, so is Israeli citizen, originally from Russia, just published Putin's Mafia State that looks at these things. And the, uh, the new black book uh, of corruption from Transparency International and Civitas on corruption and state capture in Hungary. These are very good case studies. And if we are not successful, they will be coming to Germany and Czech Republic and France and other countries in the near future. And certainly it's happening in Georgia also. Yeah, as a first-hand experience, that's really quite nice. <laughs> um. Vola, um, could you please share your experience because you were on the front lines of fighting these liberal regimes and I'm pretty sure a lot of people in this room, especially Georgians, would uh, love to hear about your experience and if you could give some advice to people who are right now thinking about initiatives on how to fight these kind of regimes. Yeah, so uh, as I said, I was growing up in uh, the state where I was pretty limited from the information uh, from the education in politics, the politics it's a, in general has been forbidden in Belarus or being interested in politics was pretty forbidden in Belarus. Discussing it is even more forbidden. You could be in prison for the discussion. So I think it's kind of the Soviet tradition when people were discussing the politics only in the kitchen, silently with like the very limited number of uh, friends or family members. Uh, so um, the first time I've heard something about the things that like something was wrong uh, with the authorities in Belarus was in 2011 after the explosion in Minsk metro that was prepared by Lukashenko himself. But uh, at that moment, like, I mean, people were absolutely not educated. So my parents couldn't discuss like what happened in particular. They were extremely scared as all of us were. Um, but they were just saying like something is wrong if they can't protect the citizens of the country from those things, while they say that like, okay, we're fighting terrorism, et cetera, et cetera. We have new challenges in the country. So they were in fact stricting the laws in the country, uh, covering it with countering terrorism. And uh, at the same time, just like limiting the freedoms and people couldn't even understand what was going on. People just thought that like Lukashenko is standing for them, like defending the uh, humans in, uh, in the country. So, um, in 2016, I went to study in European Humanities University, which is at Larissan University in exile in Lithuania. I had no idea what was the reason for the exile of my university. It was just like a random thing that I went to study there, I would say. Uh, and I learned it only later, uh, around 2020, like it was 2019, when I learned this story behind the exile of Belarusian University, that the idea was that like in 1990s, Lukashenko wanted like they put the control over all the universities in Belarus, like they introduced the security um, security directors to the university. In fact, they were KGB uh, agents, officers, who were just like following all the students and academics in the universities. Just like for them not to speak up, not to develop the freedom of thought or anything like that. And the, the EGU didn't allow to put the, the controlling person to the um, 
ruling organs of the university, so they had to uh, leave the country. It was the university was closed in the country, even though it was very uh, popular among the politicians, like the kid, children of politicians and diplomats, the recent diplomats went to that university because, like, uh, it was the university that in invited the European academics as the lecturers that developed the freedom of conscious thought, the freedom of religion, like they introduced those concepts to the Belarusian students for the first time. Uh, so it was closed, it got to exile. Uh, and when I started learning there, I started in there, um, I started just understanding that, okay, something's wrong with uh, the human rights in Belarus because I studied international law. And at that moment, I realized that, okay, it's impossible to bring any changes to Belarus. Belarus is hopeless. Maybe I will just uh, get employed to like some international organization as the UN, for example, out of a sudden, but maybe it will help to help Belarusians somehow. But I didn't see any chance for Belarus to become uh, a democratic country to defend human rights there on the ground. So, but 2020 had came and it started with COVID. Uh, it was the first time when people that obviously all the countries saw how indifferent the authorities were to the human lives in Belarus. And people started coordinating them themselves. Uh, they started helping each other. They just brought some, they started some organizations that were bringing the medical equipment from abroad or like in, from Russia to Belarus just to help the musicians, the medical workers, because this day didn't do anything. Lukashenko barely said that COVID doesn't exist. I can't see it in the air, so it doesn't exist. Uh, play the hockey, drink vodka, work in the field, you'll be fine. COVID doesn't exist. So people started understanding like, okay, it's only us who can help ourselves. And it, it still, it was the year of the elections. And of course, Lukashenko, uh, didn't want to postpone it because COVID didn't exist. So they just wanted to introduce some additional measures to the electoral uh, polls, polling stations. Um, but the elections were named to the 9th of August. And as far as people started communicating more between themselves, as far as people saw like the difference in the society and, and the attitude of the authorities, um, it, it has become clear that something would change this year. And there appeared the alternative candidates. One of them was a blogger. Another one was uh, an ex uh from the bank associated with Russia, but still like, he was an amazing manager. And that another one was the person who was developing the uh, park of high technologies in Belarus. Uh, two of them were imprisoned yet before the elections. One of them had to flee the country and the wife of uh, one of the imprisoned candidates registered her candidacy to the presidents. And it was the moment when people understood that, okay, this is the year of changes probably. People started going to the streets to protest. People started going to the streets to collect the signatures for the alternative candidate. And it never happened in Belarus to such a degree. I mean, yes, there were protests. There were repressions. There were arrests of those people who were protesting in the streets or even wearing some particular colors of, like of the independent flag of Belarus. But such numbers have never been in the streets of Belarus for such a long time. So by the August 2020, there were around 50 political prisoners in Belarus already after the protests that took place during the presidential campaign. And in August, the election took place. People went to the streets because for the first, during the first night after the elections, the uh, electoral committee said that Lukashenko is winning, as far as we can see from the results from the polling stations. Uh, so he is getting around 80%. And of course, people knew that like we had a number of signs that are pretty um, spread in the movements uh, related to the elections. Like when you wear a white bracelet or like a particular sign that states that like, okay, I'm voting for an alternative president, uh, candidate. So people were wearing the signs, people were in the street waiting for the results. And then they were told that like, okay, 80% wins Lukashenko. Uh, people went to the protest. It was answered by the violence, the brutality and torture. Uh, one person, like two people were killed during protests in different, com in different um, cities. And more than 6,000 people went through torture during three days, three, three nights of protests. For the, the Belarus with nine and four million uh, inhabitants, it's 
a huge number. We've never saw such violence in Belarus. So people went to the protest, the peaceful one, uh, just like demanding the free elections, the freedom of for political prisoners, and to stop the violence, stop the brutality of the police. Um, at that moment, there were hundreds of thousands of Belarusians in the street, and it seemed like there is no other chance than like Lukashenko running away. Like, look, there are like 300,000 people only in Minsk, only in the capital. So like, and there are hundreds of thousands of other cities. So of course we are winning, of course he, he, he is given the power. But I would say it's one of the mistakes that as far as now I can see from the experience that I was given by HRF as a fellow, that that's the feeling that people get when they see the numbers, but we they have no strategy. They have no idea what is the strategy for change. We just thought that numbers can help to defeat the dictator. It never can. Numbers are not enough for defeating dictators, authoritarian rulers, whoever. It's not enough even to change a tiny policy in the country usually, because it's not numbers that bring the changes. The numbers just support those changes. And we had only the numbers in the streets. We didn't have the leaders in the country. They were, but like Tikhanovskaya herself had to flee the country. Uh, the oppositional candidates were imprisoned. Only one woman was remaining in Belarus, who was one of the leaders of the movement, but she was imprisoned in September. And like the idea of Lukashenko was to bring her out of the country, but she just uh, destroyed her passport on the border with Ukraine, and they put her into prison. So people were just going to the street to go to the street, just to say that like we disagree with you, but there were no further actions that followed the protests. So people went to the streets, then they started going home, they were arrested, beaten, imprisoned, some of them went for, to prison for criminal charges, some of them stayed in prison for administrative charges, but around 50,000 people went through prison like for one year in 2020. It's a crazy, it's a huge number, but it didn't change anything besides the growth of the fear for people who stayed in Belarus. From 200 to 500,000 people had to flee the country. So it's also a huge number for, for our country, for any country. But Belarus is not that big in numbers. So, yeah, and the, the basic mistake was not having the strategy. And I remember we were talking with Sergei Popovich when I became a Freedom Fellow at Human Rights Foundation. And um, he was explaining us the idea behind the nonviolent movements and how to build them and what is the idea behind the success of nonviolent movements. And he said, like, you have to have strategy, tactics, numbers, leaders. And I was like, we had it all in Belarus. We didn't win. He was like, no, Wally, you didn't have number. You, you had numbers. You had leaders for a while. But you didn't have tactics and strategy. I was like, we had it. And we were arguing for, like, maybe 30 minutes. He was trying to, to prove that we didn't have the tactics and strategy. And then finally he asked, like, okay, Wally, if you had tactics and strategy, what was the strategy? And I said, uh, well, um, I don't know because I didn't develop it because I was just a participant at that moment. Like uh, we just started our own uh, movement or like activism with uh, my friends, but I was not the activist before, so I didn't participate in developing the strategy. So I had no idea what was what was behind the, those protests. And Sergei so told me, if you didn't know the strategy, there was no strategy because people have to know what's behind your protests, what's behind every action of yours. What are you demanding with your protests? Where are you going after the protest? Or like when in particular are you all staying in the street, not leaving it until like, for example, political prisoners are being released? And we had no idea about it. We just went to the protest, went around the police cordons and went back home. Sometimes we were running away from the police, of course, because like they started catching people in the outskirts of the city but we had no idea what was behind it. We just needed to see each other and we thought that it was enough. So what I say now to all the activists or to those who have kind of more chances than we do now, I mean, we also have chances and we are preparing for the next chance. But what I say right now always is develop the strategy. Don't think only about tactics. Don't think only about the next step, think about 10 steps ahead and how they would influence the future. 
what are you going to achieve with these particular steps? What are the risks behind those particular steps? And how you can cover those risks? Because people have to be prepared for everything. People have to, to know how to act when they have been imprisoned, interrogated, how that they won't be left alone if they are tortured, that people will be standing in the street and waiting for them to be released. It's like the very basic thing, but we didn't have that knowledge. We had no idea how to act. We had no idea where it would lead and for how long it would last. We just thought that we need to go to the street and it will end at some point. Lukashenko will just run away. He, he didn't, evidently. Yes, he had the support of Putin, but he also had, he knew that we didn't have the tactics and strategy. So that's the, the very basic thing. I think I will cover them tomorrow, building the movement and building those tactics, like discovering what is going on in the society in general. But it's the very basic thing, develop the strategy. It's the first step, bringing the people in and developing the strategy. Thanks a lot, as she said. Uh, for those of you who have signed up for the activism module for tomorrow, you will hear more about that. And I hope you will make good notes to then implement those in your countries. Um, unfortunately, even though this is a subject that can be a whole university course, we don't have much time left. But Tom, if you would like to give an advice um, to the audience uh, for fighting against liberal regimes, what would it be? A couple of things. One is be willing to be inspired by people Maria, like Maria Kalishnikova, the woman that was just described. This is a beautiful human being and a beautifully courageous person. She would not allow herself to be deported. She destroyed her passport, passport so she could not be sent into another country. And now she's in prison. Uh, and she is just a beacon of, of strength. Uh, another one, Maria Corina Machado. So I had the privilege of interviewing her in a podcast last week. Um, and you can find it online. She's amazing. She's the Iron Lady of Latin America. She stood up to the regime for years and years, seven years she's been in hiding in Venezuela. She can't leave the country. And so if you go to the YouTube channel for Atlas Network, you'll find it. I do a monthly podcast called uh, Freedom Worldwide. And uh, this, uh, this was a special one, so we did two this month uh, on Venezuela, including a member of the Venezuelan Students for Liberty, Pedro Orchurto, who's in hiding in the Argentine embassy because he will be liquidated uh, by the regime if they catch him. Uh, and what they did, and my gosh, they thought this through very carefully and surprised the regime and humiliated them by getting the electronic vote tallies and the documentation that they had won the election. The Gonzalez, the opposition, very unknown person because she was disqualified. So they allowed him to run and he ended up getting two thirds of the vote. Uh, so watch that when you have, it's about 40 minutes. Uh, she walks through how they did it and the strength that they had to carry this out. She's really uh, such an admirable person. Uh, and then the other thing is uh, to show the international support for people who are on the, the real front lines where they face violence, Belarus, Georgia, Venezuela, Ukraine, I hope I'm not leaving some country out. I'm sure there are other places the autocrats are doing terrible things also. But in those places, it's really important for people to know we're not alone, to get visitors like all the SFLers who went to Georgia. This is really powerful for our Georgian friends to, to say we will stay the course and do this. And for our Ukrainian friends, uh, for the Venezuelans to know they have support all across the world, uh, certainly among Le other Latin countries, but in Europe and, and Africa and Asia. Our Ugandan friends who organized in a Russian-sponsored regime pro-Ukrainian marches. Uh, these are really brave people. Uh, Ugandan Students for Liberty who did this. They also smuggle gay people out of the country who are targeted for execution by the regime. So they have an underground rail railroad to uh, defend these people. They need to know they're not alone and that you are with them. And anything you can do to express that solidarity 
is very much appreciated. That's something all of us can do publicly, in writing, petitions, going to visit when possible, because it's very hard to be facing violence every day from these regimes. And it gives them so much more strength to stick it through to the end when they know that they have you behind them. Thank you very much to both of you. Um, I think with this we conclude our session today. You will hear more uh, from Bola tomorrow. Unfortunately, you will not hear more from Tom tomorrow. Um, but we can continue these conversations in private uh, this evening. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.